Um, hello, everyone. My name is Peruvian Bull, and I am presenting on the dollar endgame. And this is something I've been working on for quite a long period of time. Um, I started writing back in 2021 um, this series, and I never actually intended for it to develop into anything real. I was just trying to explain my own thesis, what I had read, what I would understood about the dollar-based global monetary system, how it could devolve, and what that could mean for the future of, of Bitcoin and the future of the global monetary system. All right, I got a question for you guys. Who here is bearish on fiat? Raise your hands. Okay, this is an easy crowd. Who here, who here is bearish on the dollar? Okay, pretty good too. And if the clicker is gonna work, you're not bearish enough. In this presentation, we're gonna talk about what happens when the global monetary system breaks down, especially once the feedback loops of something called Triffin's Dilemma start to play into effect and what this could mean, like we said, for the future of Bitcoin and for the future of the dollars that you hold in your hand. Our story starts in 1960. An economist by the name of Robert Triffin goes in front of Congress and he, pre he presents what he calls a fatal flaw in the dollar monetary system, in the Bretton Woods monetary system. He essentially notes that there's, a, there's eternal demand for U.S. dollars outside of U, the, the borders of the U.S. But the problem is the U.S. has to fund these, these, th this demand. If it doesn't, then we start to see a breakdown. Uh, if it's going to... We start to see a lack of uh, liquidity globally and a lack of reserves. So this means that countries aren't able to trade with each other because since the dollar is the world reserve currency and since it's using international trade, there's not, if there's not enough dollars exported, there's not enough dollars to fund that trade and to allow, to grease the wheels of commerce to allow that trade to happen. And so he essentially said, if we keep down this path, we have two choices. If we decide choice A, to keep funding these deficits, to keep printing dollars and exporting them, which means running what's called a current account deficit, the value of the dollar is eventually going to be uh, undermined because Right now, you know, as of, as of the time he was speaking, the dollar was pegged to $35 an ounce. And in order to fund these deficits, the U.S. would have to like, reduce this reserve ratio over time and devalue this reserve ratio and send out more and more dollars, essentially causing a risk of a run on their own bank, right? A run on the dollar, a run on gold itself. And it, this is exactly what happened. Look, if we see the gold reserves and the trade de deficit as, you know, uh, Bretton Woods came into effect, and then as the, the U.S. and the world started to globalize, especially post about 1950, um, we start to see a massive push of dollars overseas. And these dollars, beginning in about the 1960s, 1965, um, begin to get called back for real gold. Um, Charles de Gaulle, the president of France, did the calculus and realized that there's about three to four times as many dollars issued as was justified by the U.S.'s reserve ratio at the time. And so he began in 1965 to withdraw dollars with the famous you know, boats in the New York Harbor demanding gold from the Fed. Um, but he wasn't the, the only one. There were other nations too. Many of the G7 started to withdraw um, gold from the Fed. And we, saw, we see a massive decline in, in gold reserves. And to stop this, of course, in 1971, Nixon closes the gold window. He tries to stem the bleeding to stop this, this crisis. But the problem is the crisis only spreads. Instead of now being you know, isolated to the gold reserves, it moves into the strength of the US dollar itself. We see a fall in the value of the US dollar for the next 10 years or so as the, the feedback loops of the system start to come into effect, as this weak dollar um, and the weaknesses in the dollar of, the, of these constant current account deficits start to feed into effect. However, Something that was not well known at the time was the emergence and the growth of something called the euro dollar system. Uh, dollar deposits and dollar loans outside of the United States started to grow exponentially in the late 60s and early 70s. And what this started to do was create persistent global demand for dollars without having a need for a, a gold-backed um, currency or the need for um, like a technical uh, parity with gold. And you know, to add on to this, in, the in 1974, I believe, 
Um, Kissinger went to Saudi Arabia and started the, the, the beginnings of the agreements that started to lead to the petrodollar system, which also added persistent global demand for dollars. And with this, the combination of these two forces, suddenly the dollar started to stabilize. Volcker came in in the late 1970s and kind of put the nail in the coffin and helped to just firm up the dollar system and just show global creditors on a, on a, on a, scale, on a very, very, uh, how do you say, like severe scale with the Volcker shock that he was willing to sacrifice the U.S. economy in order to maintain U.S. Treasury uh, money, U.S. Treasury's money good in, in real terms. He said, we'll, we'll hike rates to 20%. That's fine with me. I need these rates these high to show the global monetary system we're serious about maintaining the real value of our treasuries. Our reserves are money good. This is, this is the world reserve currency. You can hold our reserves and they won't lose their value. If this is... Okay, so this is how the process works. So, you know, let's say you're a small nation like Liberia. You, you're just entering global trade. Um, your economy is growing, and with it, the size of your forex market, your currency. You, you have to have a currency in order to uh, exist as a modern fiat nation. And to shore up this currency in the case of, you know, devaluations, currency attacks, I don't know, domestic uh, political problems, you need to have... Um, you need to have reserves, you need to have cash, you need to have something to defend this currency and to hold the peg to make sure it doesn't devalue too hard and cause runaway inflation it, um, in your imported goods. So you start buying or you start accumulating U.S. dollars. And the way you can do this is either trading directly with the U.S., obviously, or just by trading with other non-U.S. trading partners that use U.S. dollars. And you start building up these massive, massive dollar surpluses and you're not just going to sit here and just hold you know, hundreds of billions of dollars on your balance sheet, you want to reinvest them in something, and so you push them mainly into treasuries. And the end result is the U.S. gets a ton of cheap debt, we get a ton of cheap consumer goods, and all these other nations get slapped with, you know, all these reserves that, at least at the time, were money good and were earning a real interest rate, and were giving them a sustainable source of income, and, and were a viable way for them to defend their currency in the case of a crisis. We saw this play out in the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Uh, we saw this play out, we're seeing this play out right now with Japan, and they're defending their currency um, and running currency market operations. And this, this problem doesn't only exist, and this, this cycle doesn't only exist with Liberia, obviously, this is a global, issue. This is, hap is happening on a global scale. All these nations are buying or accumulating U.S. dollars and reinvesting them back into the United States. Maybe I'll move over here because the ticker is really slow. So here we can see um, this exact process play out. Here's the balance of trade. Right after the petrodollar system begins, um, and the gold reserves are no longer the, um, the release valve for the pressure on our currency. Now we have to be continually exporting more and more dollars, which the inverse of that equation means we have to be importing more and more goods. So U.S. trade deficits blow out. So the U.S. manufacturing sector over time has to be deindustrialized, has to be unshored. We have to shore all of our manufacturing to other nations so that we can continue to export these dollars to the global system to fund it as it needs to be funded. And this is something that's really important. Um, you know, Saylor says there's no second best, and I agree. In terms of reserve currencies especially, there is no second best. There's nothing even close to the U.S. dollar. If we look at the term in terms of U.S. Uh, forex or global forex reserves, the U.S. dollar is 62%. Trade invoice is over, trade invoices globally is over 50%. Um, in terms of interregional global trade, it's over 80%. I mean, metric after metric you can look at, the dollar absolutely dominates. For example, when you know South Africa and Taiwan want to trade, they have to. If 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 two country if two companies want to trade, you know, let's say copper, they can't trade in their own currencies, and they can't do even a currency swap in their own currency. What they have to do always is to convert to USDs and then convert the USDs to the other person's currency. Now this sets up what I call the Sword of Damocles. Um, if you're not familiar, the Sword of Damocles is a fable written by Cicero in the third century BC about um, a king sitting in um, the island of Syracuse. And the king was, was named Dionysus. And he had a court flatterer named, named Damocles who would constantly come up to him and tell him how amazing his life was, how, you know, how woe it was to be him, and he wanted to have his power. 
And so one day, Dionysus says, okay, well, I'll let you sit in, in the throne. I'll let you have all the, the royal privileges. But um, when, when uh, Damocles sits and is enjoying all the grapes and the cheese and wine, he, he looks up and notices a sword saying, hanging by a single strand of horsehair. And the story is meant to re represent the risk that hegemony brings. You know, with, with uh, the most power comes the most to lose. And the U.S. Is, has, has seen this happen um, in all respects. This is something called the U.S. Net International Investment Position. Um, basically, it takes the amount of assets we own and then the um, uh, foreigner's assets and then the amount they own of ours. And right now, it's sitting at an approximately negative 60% of GDP. Foreigners own approximately uh, $43 trillion of U.S. assets, while we only own $29 trillion of their assets. And this is a, a side effect of all this dollar recycling that's been going on. But this has started to change, interestingly. Um, Luke Groman noted in, uh, a couple years ago that in 2015, central banks, foreign central banks on net are no longer buying U.S. treasuries. If we look at just foreign, total foreign private and uh, you know, um, public holders, meaning central banks and private institutions, the pace of their slowing has, go, has slowed down, uh, of their buying has slowed down. They used to be buying 71% um, of treasury issuance post-2008, and now it's only 14%. And we can see this right here in the graph of um, the treasury holdings from the Fed and from other central banks. It's a bit like a restaurant uh, chef eating their own cooking, like Lynn Alden says. Instead of uh, us allowing the global system to fund the, the massive sales of treasury purchases or treasury issuance we'll need to be, to, to be doing, we're now having to do it ourselves. And this is a massive regime shift. This is something that's different. This is something that's new that hasn't happened in the last... 50, 60 years. This BIS paper kind of, you know, hits the nail on the head and says, look, if we run persistent current account deficits to provide the rest of the world with reserves, in doing so, we will become more indebted to foreigners until the risk-free asset ceases to be risk-free. And this is the sort of Damocles. This is the problem that uh, Triffin was trying to address in his talk in front of Congress in 1960. Now I want to talk about something called, I call financial gravity. So as I'm sure as many of you know, in 1913, uh, the Fed was created as a solution to bank runs. And essentially what the Fed was going to do was create something called bank reserves or settlement balances that it could push into the monetary system anytime there was a crisis and stabilize the monetary system and prevent further bank runs. And in the 1930s, the Fed taste, faced the worst test that they had ever faced yet. Um, and sadly, they were extremely, extremely misguided, and they did not correctly address the situation. Over 30,000 bank and non-bank financial institutions failed during the Great Depression, um, and M3 money supply contracted by about 30%. And in the wake of the Great Depression, many monetary scholars decided that they wanted to see a reimagined Federal Reserve, a, federal, a Fed that would manage the business cycle, a Fed that could use interest rates, not only obviously as a tool to manage reserves and try to manage the financial system, but more broadly ma manage the entire economy. And this was backed up, of course, by Keynesian economic thinking at the time, um, and this thinking has only developed as we've gone on. And so their goal was every time there is a uh, boom every time there's economic growth, every time nominal GDP is rising, real wages are rising, we're going to start hiking rates, we're going to start slowing credit growth, we're going to start contracting the economy. And then as you see during the in the great bars as illustra uh, in illustrated here, once there's a recession, we're going to drop interest rates and bring them lower and lower to get us out of, re of that recession. But there's a problem with this. If you lower rates every time uh, there's a recession, you're not allowing the debts that would naturally be extinguished to be extinguished. And so you're allowing debt to build up over and over and over again through this cycle. And every time the bet debt builds up, you're able to rise or raise the rates to a lower level than before. And let's see, the laser pointer isn't working. But you can see the, you can see the trend right here. Since the trough of the debt super cycle, we've had a slow and steady decline in the, the hiking cycles of the Fed and a deepening of the troughs in how low they can push rates and how long they have to push rates to get us out of recession. This is what I call financial gravity. In their vain attempt to kill the credit cycle, the Fed has created a black hole of their own design. Um, crushed by the weight of the financial debt, 
the markets and economy itself keeps contracting inwards towards collapse, but the Fed doesn't allow it to happen and keeps letting rates go lower and lower and lower, building more and more loan demand and more and more debt in this devastating feedback loop. And now it's trapped every single corner of the economy. You look at student loans, you can look at non-financial corporate debt, you can look at bank credit, you can look at motor vehicle loans, you can look at credit cards. I mean, in every metric, I could go on and on. In every single metric, debt levels are, have never been higher. And it's a result of this exact uh, feedback loop, this exact phenomenon. And with every crisis, the Fed's balance sheet has only grown. Um, in order to save the financial system, they've needed to grow not only their, um, their, their rates of, uh, or their, their depth of their, of their um, cutting cycle, but they've also need to grow their QE. They've also need to come up with new programs. They've also need to come up with uh, new swap lines to stabilize this system that keeps breaking over and over again. And the reason why is because over time, the Fed has essentially financialized and monetized the entire financial system. The majority of equity gains in the last 40 years have happened just since 2008. And that's really interesting because if you think about it, that shouldn't be generally normal. If, if you think about normal GDP growth, normal economic growth, it should be a steady, slow parabolic curve upward, not a giant hook, a fish, a fish hook that just spikes upward at the end. This is a graph from 2021 showing um, some uh, price action in SPX um, just day to day. And you can see the Fed, you know, at the time was the Fed was running, running QE, plowing a $120 billion into the markets every month. And you can see every single day the markets just kept getting walked up, walked up, walked up. You didn't really need a pulse. You didn't really need to be intelligent to make money in this time. You just throw money in the market and it just starts sprinting. However, if you divide the S&P 500 by the Fed's balance sheet, the shocking thing is since 2008, the line is flat. This means that there's basically, basically been no real growth in stock prices with the only growth being nominal growth due to money printing. And the worst part of all of this is the, is the Fed has trapped the treasury in this black hole. Uh, Hindenburg Research did a study in 2018 of the last 250 years of 55 different countries that have gone into 120% federal debt to GDP. And what they found is that in 54 of these countries, the result was either severe inflation or default. And the only exception was Japan. And Japan is currently facing their own uh, burgeoning crisis. And this, this uh, trapping of the treasury is really, really difficult because now the treasury is getting caught in this debt spiral. Now the treasury is getting caught in a situation where if it wants to keep if it wants to keep um, interest payments down, it means it needs to start fiscal austerity. It needs to cut, start cutting spending, and it needs to start raising taxes. However, the problem with that is treasury spending is a direct component of GDP. Government spending is directly additive to GDP. So if you cut government spending, all else being equal, you reduce GDP. And so unless the, the treasury itself wants to be the instigator of a recession, it can't cut too deep. And not even to mention cutting Spending is the most difficult thing that the government can do, as I'm sure all of us know. This is not a next uh, a linear process. Uh, this is not this slow moving, okay, one day there's another billion, another day there's another billion. This is an exponential process, and this is starting to play out in real time. Um, just two days ago, uh, Bloomberg reported for the first time ever, U.S. Uh, int gross interest expense so far this year is $1 trillion. Um, we've had over $600 billion in um, total debt added in the last uh, month and a half. And this process is only accelerating, and it's going to only accelerate as we move forward. Now, this brings on something I call the debt paradox. Traditional uh, Keynesian thinking would tell you to slow down inflation, to slow down the economy. Raising rates will stop, um, will stop this issue. It, it, raising rates will cool the economy, will cool credit lending. The problem with that is, is when the Treasury is the most indebted entity in the system, now what you're doing is when you raise rates on the system, you're raising rates no more so than on the Treasury. And the Treasury must pay this, it, this excessive interest rates um, with more and more debt meaning that it goes further down this debt spiral and gets caught deeper and deeper in this black hole. So therefore, if the Fed wants to save the Treasury, the more it will have to print. 
the more they hike, the more they will eventually have to print. It's very counterintuitive, but it's really interesting. And the truth is, like we've said, the treasury is not close to the event horizon. We're already past it. Uh, in 2021, Luke Roman mo uh, commented that if you count true interest expense, which is U.S. entitlements plus defense spending plus gross interest expense, divided by federal tax receipts, we were at 111%, meaning all the federal income couldn't even pay for the true interest on the debt. And that's a terrifying reality because, like as, we, as we've seen, interest payments have absolutely ripped upward. Um, I mean... This has been a, a startling graph to see. In, in July, uh, Happy Hawaiian on Twitter pointed out there was $850 billion in the trailing 12 months of interest expense. Again, an, a, a total record. This is the maturity profile of the U.S. debt. Powell says he wants to hold rates higher for longer. However, if he does so, a huge section of, of debt gets rolled over between 2024 and 2026. If he wants to do that, he's going to be resetting all this debt that was previously issued at low interest rates up at 5%. And that's not going to be good for the future of the U.S. debt spiral. Here's a chart of TLT. Um, it's down 50% year over year. Another interesting tidbit is that the U.S. 30-year bond issued in 2020 is now down also over 50%, which is the first time a 50-year bond has been down that much in over 40 years. So I want to talk some, uh, a little bit about monetary economics, um, something I found really interesting. Um, this summer, Jeff Snyder and Lynn Alden had a debate, and they were talking about the nature of QE. And Patrick McCormick asked him, you know, gun to your head, is QE money printing? And Jeff Snyder, in his typical fashion, said, no, it's an asset swap. It's just a central bank liability, and you don't worry about it. And Lynn Alden said, yes. And I would say they're both right, and they're both wrong. On a technical basis, QE isn't money printing. It is the creation of that settlement balance, that can, uh, a type of money that can only exist in the financial system. However, there exists a hidden release valve, and that release valve is the Treasury General account itself, the checking account for the US government. As you can see here, we've had massive QE programs before, but without fiscal spending to, to complement it, that those, those bank reserves, that massive influx of liquidity, doesn't flow into the real economy. It's trapped in the financial system, trapped in financial assets, trapped in bonds, trapped in equities. It doesn't move into inflation, and it doesn't move into M2. And in, um, in 2020, we can see a, a drastic change. For the first time, we were seeing massive treasury issuance and massive QE at the same time we were seeing fiscal deficits soaring. And so that, these, these bank reserves were now moved from the balance sheet of the Fed to primary dealers and to the Treasury General account. And I, I explain it as simply as the Treasury General account is spendable money by definition. All the bank reserves in the Treasury General account can be, can be spent into the real economy because why else would the Treasury sell bonds if it can't spend this, this money that they acquire in the real economy for healthcare services, for military equipment, for pensions, et cetera. And here we can see, too, this is a fairly recent Gunlock slide, de slide deck. Interest rates, if we project forward, you know, 3, 6, and 9% interest rates, will be hitting over 100% of total tax receipts as, uh, as a percent of, uh, or total interest expense as a percent of tax revenue um, within, a few, within a decade um, in the most pessimistic scenarios. And sadly, this might even be, um, this might even be optimistic. Okay. Sorry. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll speed up. Um, okay, tying it all together. So what happens when the risk-free asset ceases to be risk-free and there's a global buildup of treasuries owned by foreigners? Well, these treasuries start to be sold. Um, these, uh, the rates start to rise in the U.S., causing, you know, exacerbating the sovereign debt crisis. And the USD keeps strengthening in this, what is called the dollar milkshake theory by Brent Johnson, um, ripping, ripping currency volatility and ripping capital into the US and foreigners start to sell off their treasuries as a result um, I've talked about this again on Twitter it's this is that that problem of all this debt and all these all these US equity securities are held by these foreigners and what they need more so than anything is just US dollars to service their needs they don't necessarily need any of our debt and the end game 
is the monetization of every liability, is the dumping of these treasuries from foreigners and the forced QE by the Fed in response. Uh, like, I, like we said earlier, this is not a linear process. This is exponential. And things, in my opinion, are only going to get worse. The only comeback that all the dollar bulls have to this is there's no alternative. They say, look, Russia is a commodity exporter. China has a closed capital account. India doesn't have a debuff bond market. There's simply no alternative to the US dollar. Yes, the system is broken, but there's no way out. So why even talk about this? We're, everyone's trapped in the same prisoner's dilemma. And I say, yeah, you're right. No fiat is going to overtake the dollar. It's going to be Bitcoin. And if I can summarize the entire dollar endgame in, in one sentence, it would be all fiats into, collapse into dollars and all dollars into Bitcoin. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.